Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Hazmat Series Part 2, An Introduction to Crude Oil Transportation, brought to you by the Short Line Safety Institute and the American Short Line and Regional Railroad Association. My name is Sabrina Weiss, and I'm the Vice President of Education and Business Development for the Association. Before we begin, I want to let everyone know that we're recording this webinar, and I will make the recording available to participants for a limited time so you may go back and review anything we discussed today. To ensure quality auto for the audio for the recording, all attendees are on mute and you will only be able to hear our presenters speaking. If you have questions during the presentation, you may type them into the questions bar on your screen and we will read through all submitted questions at the end of the webinar. I want to thank today's presenters, J.R. Gellner, ASLRA's Vice President of Safety and Compliance, and Michelle Malski, our Safety Program Manager for the Short Line Safety Institute. Both of them are here with me now, and I'm going to turn things over to JR to get us started. But first, first I'm going to give you a warning because we're having a little bit of an audio uh, issue. So when I turn it over, you might hear a little bit of feedback when I switch microphones. But otherwise, here we go. In this webinar. The picture you're looking at is from Lag Megantic in July the 6th of 2013, a 74 car Bakken crude oil train free rolled into this community and derailed. And when it was said and done, there were 47 fatalities and $200 million in property damage. Needless to say, this changed the way that we look at hauling hazmat and especially crude oil. And since this derailment and, and disaster, there have been numerous regulations and emergency orders released by the FRA here in the United States and Transport Canada in Canada. So we have to focus on following the rules and procedures as carloads containing hazardous commodities are loaded, inspected, placed in a train and move towards a destination. This involves the receipt of the shipping papers and various instructions, inspections at origin or interchange or wherever a train is made up, safe train movement, and emergency response. Hazmat, by definition, is any material which may pose an unreasonable risk to health, safety, and property when transported in commerce. And this is determined by the Secretary of Transportation. We are requir required by regulation to have emergency response procedures. And the this is done by most railroads by having access to the ERG and training on the ERG with their hazmat employees. The 2016 ERG is the most recent uh, ERG available and it is it usually costs between four and ten dollars depending on the size and the way it's bound and things of that nature and you can get it uh, through the internet usually with JJ Keller or label master or somebody like that the 2016 is the most recent and you can go to the short line safety Institute website and get it there too all right one of the more common problems with hazmat loads when FRA inspectors show up and they write more defects and violations is regarding to placards. And usually that's due to faded or torn placards. But you have to do an inspection on your hazmat cars and you have to look at those placards. And you should have a placard on either side and both ends. And they should be positioned horizontally. You can't have them upside down and they need to have the correct number on the commodity and they can't you can't have missing placards or anything of that nature or the FRA will take exception to that now we see one that has the wrong number and here they're replacing one and then you can also do handwritten placards also whenever you're looking at tank cars and moving hazardous material you need to look at the qualification dates for the tank itself uh, there's a stencil 
located on the side. And you can see the circle there with the blown up section in the slide. And uh, this is where you check the car for the legibility of qualification dates. And the year that is shown that, it, that the uh, inspection or replacement is due is good until December 31st of that year. And you have to make sure that your uh, PRD tank and heater coil due dates have not passed. If they have passed, you cannot accept this car from a shipper and or even an interchange. If another railroad's interchanging it to you and the date has expired, you do not want to accept that car. If it's found in route while you, you are moving the car, you can move it to that final destination, but it has to be requalified after it reaches that destination. Whenever uh, we begin our shift, we're going to talk about hazmat inspection, switching, and handling. We'll talk about what happens when you start your shift and you're going to have to handle tank cars. You want to make sure that you have your paperwork in order. Any hazmat car that you're going to move, you have to have the proper uh, shipping information and emergency contact information in your possession. So some systems will do, will do this through a switch list and other systems out there you have to have this with a way bill. Uh, you can do handwritten way bills which uh, are shown in your uh, hazmat rules. So in, once you have your paperwork and you're, you go out and you're going to pick up hazmat cars, you have to do an inspection. And you need to do this inspection at the shipper's loading facility or when you receive an interchange or whenever you're receiving an air test on a train and it has hazmat cars in there, you have to do a hazmat inspection. And this is in addition to your mechanical inspection. When you do the hazmat inspection, you want to look for the proper placards. Like I said before, that you're going to need four with the, in accordance with your commodity requirements. So you want to make sure you have the proper UN number on those placards. You're going to look for leakage, wetness, drips, vapor clouds, hissing, those kind of things. Car access secured at the loading dome and unloading valves, which is an extremely common defect or violation. Uh, all loading hoses, lines, and platforms are in the clear. You want to make sure all blue flags and derails and wheel chocks are removed. You want to make sure that you have no abnormal or suspicious objects are present. And again, you want to check your tank qualification stencil. As you can see in this slide, we're doing inspections on the tank cars. You do not have to get up on the tank car if you're going to check the uh, loading domes and stuff on top of the tank car. But you have to do it visually from the ground. You want to visually check underneath. Anywhere that you have valves or you're going to be lo doing loading or unloading or pressure relief valves, you want, to, you want to check those real carefully when you do an inspection. You also are required by regulation to do an IED inspection. This is very important and you need to train your people and there's training available out there through various websites the TSA has some where you can include this into your hazmat training but you have to inspect both, car, both sides of the car not only just looking for the hazmat or the mechanical inspection but you also want to look for your IED inspections. If you do notice something that's strange or suspicious on the car you want to immediately move yourself away from the car and to a safe location. You don't want to utilize a radio or a cell phone if you, if you do have a cell phone available and until you're at a very safe distance for fear that the uh, radio or the cell phone uses could activate the explosives. You want to contact plant personnel if you're in a plant to let them know immediately. You want to contact your train dispatcher, managers, superintendents, transportation, uh, train masters, those type people. You want to contact the proper authorities. The first thing you want to do is get yourself at a safe distance and then make sure you can protect the people that are closest to the tank. You also, if there is something like this found at some point in time, then we also are required 
through regulation to contact TSA to let them know that we have found this type of device on a hazmat car. <clears throat> Train locations is extremely important for, for you to be aware of whenever you're utilizing uh, or moving transporting hazmat cars. You have to have the information of the position of the cars in your train. And the regulation requires it's that at least a crew member has that information available. So this is very important. You want to make sure that you document the position of these cars in your train as you are moving the product. And if you make pickups or set outs, you have to go in and have to re change or redo the paperwork to be up to date with where your hazardous cars are in your train. So in the case of an uh, emergency, you want to uh, gather up the paperwork and determine if hazmat is involved. And, and if you do have company provided cell phones, something of that nature, you want to take those with you and try to safely inspect the train. If you see fire, vapor clouds, smell anything unusual, you want to move quickly upwind and uphill from the incident. You want to avoid ditches and low-lying areas and monitor the wind direction as best as you can. And you want to call 911 as quickly as possible and, uh, to, and, and develop a meeting location to get with 911 so you can get them as close as possible to the derailment. You want to warn any other persons in harm's way call supervisors, dispatchers, and cooperate fully with first responders. You also want to try to, it's a recommendation if you have, if you move a lot of hazmat, you want to work on and develop emergency, emergency and crisis plans, and you want to train on those, and you want to work with your emergency responders. It's a big thing in hazmat right now, especially with crude oil, on how well the railroads are working with emergency responders in the communities that they operate in. So if there's there's training available for emergency responders, we have trip training that's on the association and I believe the Safety Institute website, and there are other uh, means out there. Transcare website has training for emergency responders that you can do online. So even for your volunteer fire departments or just fire departments of small communities, there are resources that are available out there. This is very, very important that you include these type of things in your training. Switching. If you use, uh, most railroads use instruction for handling haz hazardous materials by rail. Inside that rule book, you're going to have a matrix like the one you're seeing to talk to, that uh, addresses the regulations and the rules whenever you're switching. And for crude oil, the uh, crude oil is going to uh, fall, I believe crude oil is in group E. And you can look down a group E column and see that the only, the only regulations govern crude oil whenever you're switching crude oil, and this is in a switching operation, is that is, if a person's riding the car and they're going to have to use the handbrake, they have to make sure that that handbrake is working properly. And they, you can't cut off cars until all preceding cars are clear of a lead, and you can't cut off another set of cars until that initial car set of cars are clear of a lead. You also, whenever you're switching, you want to make sure before you start a switching operation, especially in plants, or transload areas. You want to make sure that blue flags and blue flag derails uh, are removed, wheel chocks are removed, and as I'm sure many of you know, blue flags can only be removed by the people that actually place those blue flags on the track. Another thing you want to be particularly careful of whenever you're switching in a plant, people are removing blue flags, is you want to make sure that the plant personnel understand that when they remove the blue flags and want you to come in and pick up cars, that all loading operations on that track have to cease. I have, in my own experience, seen where on the uh, one end of the track, they took the blue flags down and cars were all loaded and ready to go. And on the other end of the same track, 
they still have people doing a transload or loading operation without any blue flag protection. And this can be very dangerous, so you want to make sure you pay attention to that. So um, here is a here is a switch switch uh, matrix that we were talking about that's in the rule book, and this is where you can this is very valuable, very important. You can use it in your training. It's uh, everybody uses this. This is a standard that's been developed by the railroads with the FRA. So it's a real quick quick way to look up what you need to do with certain commodities when you're switching. And the uh, position and train. We have the same type of matrix in uh, in the rule book, so uh, you want to make sure that you review this whenever you're doing any kind of movement outside of a switching movement. So you want to make sure that you have these cars in the right position before the train departs the initial terminal and before it departs an intermediate station or where you do set outs and pickups and route and when delivering or picking up cars at interchange. Because when you're delivering and picking up cars at interchange, that's not considered a switching move. So you have to you have to keep your hazmat positioned in your train in your train correctly. And the basics on on covering hazmat loads is you have to have five cars uh, if you have enough non hazmat cars. So your loaded hazmat car has to be number six. And if you don't have enough to make it six deep, you have to have a very minimum of at least one cover car. And there are certain uh, opened-in cars and certain other type of cars that cannot be used as buffers. So um, here in this diagram, we talk about a load from one group can't be coupled to loads from another group. So in other words, loads in group D can't be coupled to loads in group C. So if you had an anhydrous car, you wouldn't want to couple it to a radioactive car. You have to be aware of these things. And then here we talk about this again. If you have a crude oil car, you can't have it connected to an inhalation hazard car. If it's placard that away, and that's what the shipping papers are. You can't do that. And we get into the proper makeup of cars and talk about buffer cars or cover cars. Buffer car or cover car cannot include any locomotive, whether it's running, dead, occupied, not occupied. A locomotive is not ever considered a buffer car. Buffer cars may include residue and empty tank cars as long as it's not next to a locomotive running or dead. So a residue car has to be at least one car or second car back has to be separated by a minimum of one car. And you want to remember you need five buffer cars if available to cover a hazmat load, one for a residue load. And you'll see in the diagram how we have that broke down. And if you look at the third line, you can see that a residue is actually used as part of the buffer to get your five buffer cars for a loaded car. You can do that as long as you make sure that that residue car is not next to the locomotive. And then here we have a diagram of where we're not, we do not have the proper amount of buffer cars between the locomotives. Four is not enough, three is not enough, and a residue right up next to the locomotive is not enough. We talked about there's certain types of cars that you can't use. Uh, as buffer cars, so flat car loads can be used if there are no bulkheads, and gondola loads cannot be used if uh, the load extends above the end of the car wall. Mechanical reefers cannot be used, and as if the reefer engine is running, and placard residue empty cars cannot be used if moved next to a locomotive. And if your train link doesn't allow you to have the five buffer cars, then you have to use whatever non-hazardous cars you can use with a minimum of one buffer car when you're talking about a, a unit train or an all-loaded train of hazmat material. So once you 
have your train put together and you're going to leave, you're done with your switching, you're going to leave your final destination or you're going to leave your, your uh, initial terminal or wherever you picked up the car and go farther down the railroad or to your interchange location, the, uh, you have to do a final inspection. And you can usually determine where you need to do a final inspection as to where you need to do an air test on the train. If you have to do an air test on the train, then you have to have your cars positioned correctly and you have to do an inspection for a hazmat. And any missing or messed up placards need to be replaced at that particular time. You have to walk all sides of the car. You cannot drive a hazmat inspection. I know some of the railroads I've been associated with in the past use uh, support vehicles with the train that conductors and brakemen might use. And you, I know that if you can see the air brake cylinders on the cars, the FRA allows you to drive that inspection when you're doing an air brake inspection or a mechanical inspection. But you cannot ever drive a hazmat inspection. So if you have a train that's partially made up of hazmat cars, once they're driving that air brake test and doing that mechanical inspection, when they come to hazmat cars, they have to stop and get out of the vehicle and walk all the way around both sides of a hazmat car. Then you want to double check your paperwork and make sure that it's documented and that it's clearly documented. The, the worst thing that can happen is if you do have a situation or an emergency, an emergency responder show up and you've got a big wad of papers, everybody's going to be nervous already and a little bit of anxiety. You want to make sure that paperwork's clear. If you haven't documented it real, clear, real clearly, then you're just, you're just creating more problems for yourself. So you want to make sure you got that documented where it's really legible. If FRA comes in, boards a train, a hazmat train, and they look at that paperwork and it's, it's in, a, in a mess, then they're going to take exception to that. And here we've got it noted in the slide where they're talking about in their briefing that the cars has and that cars are nine cars deep, and then there it is on their paperwork. And some trains, especially with newer regulations, depending on if you're in high threat urban areas and things of that nature, you may have speed restrictions on the train. So that needs to be, everybody needs to have an understanding and know that. That needs to be part of your training. And then, as we've said in the past, anytime you pick up cars or set out cars, you need to redo the paperwork and update that paperwork. And uh, I guess that's it. I have questions for three. Sure, we've got a couple here, and I'll just remind folks that um, if you have questions, you can type them in to the questions bar on your module there. So we've got a couple that have come in. The first one is, what is the most common tank car violation from FRA, I guess? Probably the most common violation is uh, missing placards or faded placards, something wrong with the placards. But also, we have a lot of violations with problems with the, the upper, the top dome of the car because a lot of times people don't really pay attention to that. You have seals and gasket problems up there. You just want to make sure that those are sealed properly. And if you can see loose bolts and things like that from the ground, then you need to not accept that car and to address that situation. So those would be the most two common. Okay. Um, there's another one here. You just mentioned faded placards, and uh, one person has asked, does it matter if the placards are faded while in storage? As, as long as, is it, are we talking, I guess we would be talking about loads and empties and if it's in an active yard. If it's, if, if those, if those cars are stored in a plant or in a lease track that's solely used by that customer and they won't be considered part of the general system, so the placards don't have to be up to date. But once those placards, once those cars are released back to the railroad and are going to be part of the general system, then those placards have to be have to be updated. Now, if also if you're storing when you come to residues, if you're storing if a railroad's storing residue hazmat cars and part of their yard tracks and things of that nature, they have to be they have to keep those placards. Uh, they're considered part of the general railroad system, so you have to keep those placards up to date. They can't be faded. 
Okay, and actually, I have another question here about residue cars. It says, "Do you have to walk? Do you have to walk residue cars while air testing a manifest train?" Yes, residue cars or hazmat cars. So whenever you're talking about a hazmat inspection, it doesn't matter whether they're loads or residues; they're hazmat, so they have to be inspected. Okay. Another question we have is, why can't flat cars without bulkheads be used as a buffer? Because the uh, possibility of the load shifting off the end of the car and into a, into a hazmat car. Now, if the flat car that doesn't have bulkheads, if it's empty and has nothing on it, they can't have anything on it. If it's absolutely empty, then it can be used as a buffer. But if it has any kind of product, pipes, or equipment, or anything like that, then where that you could shift around and it can be used as a buffer. Great, thanks for that clarification. Um, where can I get the switching and train placement tables shown in the presentation? Well, the, the uh, Class 1 railroads put together the, uh, the uh, instructions for movement of hazmat by rail. The most current version is uh, June the 30th of 2015. I don't really know what website it's on. I do have a I do have a copy of it, so I I'll be happy to email it to somebody. The entire rule book and within that rule book is where the matrix are of those diagrams. Okay, and we can probably look that up and, and send a note out to folks after the webinar and just let them know if, if it's on a website somewhere that they could access it. Yeah, or they can they can or they can email me directly. And directly. I, yep, and I'll email it to them. Okay. Um, that looks, well, we've got a couple more questions coming in, but let me really quickly, I know Michelle wanted to mention some upcoming webinars, and then I'll go back to these other questions we've got here. Yes, thank you everyone for joining us again for the continuation of our HAZMAT series. In September, we look forward to having two more HAZMAT series webinars. They will be announced shortly. We will be hosting another webinar at the end of September specific to key trains and other hazardous movements with unit trains. So stay tuned for more information about that. Excellent. Okay, um, looks like I've got one more question here. So if anybody else has questions, go ahead and type them in quickly before we wrap up. Uh, this last one is, can I, have a cop can I have this program to use for training on our railroad? So I assume that means can they get a copy of the PowerPoint presentation? to use on their railroad. Absolutely. You can send me an email and I will send you that in a PDF format. No problem. Just uh, shoot me an email and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. Okay. It looks like somebody else just typed in a request for it with their email and I'll just um, point out, so both JR's and Michelle's contact information is on this last screen here that you're looking, on, looking at. So you take a moment and jot down their phone numbers or their email addresses and that way, if you have any questions or, or want to get a copy of the presentation um, after we wrap up here, you can reach out to them directly to make that request. Um, I'll remind everyone that we, we've been recording today's webinar. So um, once we've got that processed and uploaded to the website, you will receive an email letting you know that it's there and you can access the recorded webinar to go back and review it or have others from your um, railroad take a look at it. I um, have a couple more questions that are coming in here really quickly. Uh, one is, residue is an empty hazmat car, is that right? That's correct. That's correct. Okay. So, yes. And um, on one of the slides, you said to make sure the PRD tank and heater coil due dates have not passed. What is a PRD? A pressure relief device. Excellent. And I will uh, just touch base on that just a little bit. Um, PRDs are actually fittings. They're, they're something such as like a regulating valve, and they're used on certain tank cars, and, and they actually vent vapor during transportation, and that, that's normal. There's two different types of PRDs. There's reclosing devices, such as pressure release valves, and there's also non-closing, non-reclosing devices, such as safety vents, and they're also called ruptured disc devices. So those are just two forms of what PRDs would be. Great. That's a great explanation. Thank you. Um, we have a follow-up on the residue car question, which is, when is a hazmat car considered empty and not a residue car? Well, that's that's kind of a ongoing debate a lot of times. <laughs> Usually the customer the customer will will determine when the car is 
considered a residue. The railroad has to base that upon what the customer says. But the, the industry standard is, I believe, I believe it's around 7% volume. I'll double check that and we'll post that, is what the AAR and everybody is, is it just has 7% uh, of its actual volume or less within the car. But again, there, there's a lot of discussion with the FRA about residue cars because railroads really have to base their belief that a car is a residue and not a load based upon the customer saying we've unloaded the car because the railroad has no way of telling whether the car is, is you know, 15 or 20 percent empty or 95 percent empty for the most part. So. Excellent. That's a good explanation. So um, I, I have kept a copy of all the questions that we've gotten here as well. So what we can do is um, make those available along with the answers. Um, we can post those on the website too so folks will have access. So um, I think that's the end of our questions. So again, I want to thank everybody for joining us today. Uh, we will send out a link to the recording as soon as it's ready. ready and we will look forward to... Uh, having you all join us for our next webinar. And there is one tomorrow on uh, um, protecting roadway workers from warm weather hazards such as